So welcome. Uh, we're just getting going again. It feels like we've been uh, uh, off on a off on a break here, uh, but I see some familiar uh, faces. Uh, just let me uh, share my screen because I'm going to uh, be the one that that takes that starts the uh, ball uh, rolling here. Um, okay, good. Okay, so. Um, everybody see my screen okay? Yes, yes. Okay, good. Nice to see you, uh, Javier. Hi. Uh, so today we're going to, it's nice to see uh, uh, some of these familiar faces because they uh, have been involved in uh, the development of uh, FPAS uh, Mark One. Okay, and today we're going to talk about uh, launching uh, F Pass Mark II, um, decision making and economic analysis in an unforecastable uh, world. Okay, uh, David Archer uh, has been the one that's been pushing us uh, to uh, to start thinking about taking uncertainty uh, seriously, and so he is uh, with us today uh, to explain a little bit about the history. Uh, as well as to get into uh, uh, how we think about uh, uh, what this means for creating scenarios, uh, how we have to maybe stop using the word baseline. Uh, so he's going to talk about reference scenarios and so on. So David, uh, maybe what you could do is provide a little bit of history uh, for how we got to today and then, and then I'll take over and then Felix uh, will come in. Uh, later to talk about some analysis that we've been doing on consumption functions and uh, equity markets and so on. Uh, David, can you uh, can you? Yeah, ab absolutely. Uh, glad glad to give a little bit of a, a, a background to how we get to where we are today. So Doug and I first came into contact, you know, a long time ago. Uh, I was at the Reserve Bank of New Zealand. We had been doing, we were about to embark on a journey, which I guess is pretty typical of what a lot of central banks have been on uh, in the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, so this was before inflation targeting. We had a, it was a, there was a very loose connection between forecasts and policy. So they really didn't, we did forecast because we sort of felt like it was an obligation to provide forecast to the wider community to show that we were contributing something of a public good, but the, the forecasts themselves really didn't connect in with the policy decision making very much at all. So the forecasts were, were things which didn't come out of a macro model we had several sort of sectoral little models, sub models, uh, added things up by spreadsheets in order to generate forecasts. But once we were given the inflation targeting construct to work with, once we were pushed into an inflation targeting world and told that, look, you know, this is serious, you guys have got to control inflation, we realized that that was not. Uh, it was not sufficient to play with forecasts and disconnect them to policy in the way that we were doing. We needed to really understand what the choices were that we had in, in the sorts of economic circumstances that we were facing. So, I mean, we had to start doing macro modeling seriously. And this is where, we, where Doug came in with some colleagues from the Bank of Canada to help us. So we were looking for a modeling, macro modeling structure where we could actually explore what it meant for policy and what alternative policy paths would do to the economy in different circumstances. So it had to have endogenous policy. We had never done endogenous policy modeling before, so, so we needed the help with that. We got there. Uh, then the question kind of, got confronted with was, well, okay, we, we can generate policy paths consistent with different worlds we're forecasting. How do we then integrate that into the decision making? And do we integrate that into the communications? As it happened in New Zealand, it was kind of straightforward on the first one because it was a single decision maker and the guy 
uh, who was making the decision was comfortable and talking about uh, poly paths generated in a model context. He had been allowed to explore uh, whether the embedded preferences that drove these policy paths were kind of consistent with his instincts about how he would re react, and they were. So that was made him comfortable. And then on the communication side, he was the one that took the big leap, it was a big leap at that stage, to go from producing forecasts and conveying forecasts to the public uh, on the basis the policy wasn't going to change and then see how bad inflation would go. Well, now we were producing forecasts which had policy change embedded in them. So kind of pretending that policy wasn't going to change was getting very awkward. And his strong preference was, I've got to tell a story about what I'm going to need to do to interest rates in order to keep inflation on track. And I don't want to be telling a story which has inflation going off track. So he was very comfortable. In fact, he was the leader in pushing us to start uh, producing all the communications consistent with the endogenous policy tracks. The slow burn question that started even way back then and still is right in front of us was how do you construct the communications and the thought process around policy, thinking about policy in a forward looking sense, but dealing with an unforecastable world? Now, we've pretty much quickly learned that it was unforecastable. The policy tracks that we were laying out as the, the, the likely tracks consist that would bring policy, but that would allow policy to bring the inflation back to target. Those policy tracks that we were publishing were never anywhere near what actually happened. It became pretty clear that uh, the forecast that we were generating really weren't good predictions at all of what was coming. And this has become increasingly clear over the, over, over the years. In the last few months, you will have been hearing a lot of talk about forecasting mistakes, big forecasting mistakes, going with big policy mistakes. Well, those forecasting mistakes are part of a world which is essentially unforecastable. Nobody knows what the future is. We don't even, we even struggle with understanding what's happening currently. This is why I started talking with Doug again after many, many years of gap uh, to start thinking about how do we transition using endogenous policy modeling, using that, that technology that we've developed, understanding that we are looking forward when we're thinking about policy, but get off the hook of thinking or pretending or conveying to the public that there is one particular outlook which is so much more likely than any other that we're going to talk about it as the centre of doing policy. When there is not a, uh, there is not such a high probability attached to any particular outlook. So FPAS Mark II, we had we spent years in FPAS Mark I. FPAS Mark II is about thinking how to do that. And the, the, the thinking that we're developing here is to drop the sense of forecasting, to drop the sense that there is a particular outlook, which is so much more likely than any other outlook that it's worth talking about, and start recognizing up front and putting it in the front of our communications that there may be different worlds that we're gonna to have to deal with over the next several years, and we don't know which different worlds they are. We can map out at least a couple of different worlds of the types that we're worried about we're gonna to have to face, and we can map out the policy paths that would go with that. So mapping out more than one reference scenario with the policy paths consistent with those reference scenarios and talking about those in the context of policy as risk management. You might have heard that term before. It uh, was, um, I'm not sure if it was introduced by Alan Greenspan uh, in, in a 
in a speech he gave to the American Economic Association, or it was simply popularized and uh, made, made famous by him. But the concept of doing policy as risk analysis, thinking about the range of, 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 uh, range of circumstances we might confront and thinking about what outcomes do we most want to avoid and positioning policy in those terms. One final point, Doug, before I hand it back to you, um, is maybe a way of conveying the points that we're still doing forward-looking. We're still being forward-looking when we're doing these things, but we're not focusing on a singular future, is to compare what a beginner learner chess player does. They learn to map out a few moves rather than just the one move. They learn to map out a few moves, but typically they are planning a sequence of moves, a single sequence of moves. They haven't yet learned how to consider the, the likely range of moves and reactions of the opponent, and then think about how to position in terms of each of the reactions that might come, uh, what they would then do in response in order to maximize the chances or minimize their risk of loss. In both cases, the beginner chess player and the, and the chess master, they're looking forward, they're totally forward looking. But in the chess master case, they are doing chess as a risk management game. So let me hand it back to you now, Doug. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, so uh, the presentations today, uh, we would like to have as much uh, interaction uh, as possible. Uh, so we are throwing these things out there about how uh, we can train people. So we're gonna have a summer school dedicated uh, entirely to uh, developing FPAS Mark II and getting it uh, implemented as quickly as possible inside uh, central banks that are interested. Uh, but there are also gonna be challenges, uh, things like, uh, communications and so on. So, uh, Jose, Shelba, uh, Abby, I see that you're there, Alberta. Uh, join in the conversation. Uh, think of this as, as very much as a work in progress. Um, can you see my screen right now? Uh, it should say, remember these guys, uh, but I just want to check. No, I can only see you, Doug. Yes, oh, you can, can only see you. Oh, you can only see me. So that is definitely a problem. Um, is that better? Yes. Yes, perfect. Okay. Uh, do you remember these guys? Does anyone uh, know the history of where calculus came from? Because I'm going to be doing uh, some optimal control today with a nonlinear model. Okay. Uh, with occasionally binding constraints, and that uh, the, that's calculus, okay? Uh, both integral and differential calculus. Does anybody know the history of, uh, of, of the very first question uh, that was assigned to these six guys? Uh, one of the guys uh, answered anonymously, uh, I recognize the lion by his claws. Does anybody know who that is? Which one of these guys uh, was the lion? Avia, you must know. Uh, Doug, it says it says on the on the screen, uh, Isaac. Isaac oh. Newton. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, 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 oh my lord. Okay, but uh, you had to pick. Uh, but anyway, uh, so the question that that uh, was posed uh, to these guys uh, was a question where if you had a particle um, and the only force on the particle was uh, gravity, uh, what shape would you, want the, would you want the particle to take to get to some spot uh, on the horizontal axis in this case that, that was at, at point B, okay? And the optimal shape uh, uh, that, that Newton uh, showed us 
uh, was something that looks like a zip line, okay, where you try to accelerate very quickly initially to build up a lot of momentum. Uh, and if you do that, uh, that momentum uh, will even allow you to climb a little bit. And so the path that the particle gets there the fastest is that. Now, the development of these frameworks, I like, I like this analogy <coughs> for numerous uh, reasons. Uh, one is that New Zealand, when they started uh, inflation targeting uh, in, the, uh, in the early 1990s, so the law was in 1989 and they started in 1990, uh, they caught everybody by surprise. Uh, many people were very skeptical uh, that this thing would work and stuff. Uh, they were simply just trying to do the right thing. Um, and of course, it was there was a bit of experimentation. They were uh, they tried to hit hit the targets much too uh, aggressively, and so on. And it it grew into a kinder and friendlier uh, monetary policy. Now, one with a uh, an explicit uh, dual mandate, okay? So they finally switched from a, an implicit dual mandate to an explicit dual mandate. And so we've been asked recently, uh, uh, how we, if we were starting a central bank uh, from scratch, how many resources would it take? Uh, what types of things would they have to do to be the best central bank in the world? And so that means that we had to go and look at uh, those central banks that we thought that were scoring the highest uh, in terms of transparency, uh, which of course is very highly correlated to the development of forecasting and policy analysis systems because transparency starts with internal transparency. Uh, and so these guys today, David and uh, both Felix, uh, come from the Reserve Bank in New Zealand. They're, uh, trained from those errors of, uh, of, of really high levels of uh, transparency and so on. Uh, so we looked at New Zealand recently, uh, and it only takes uh, 20 people. Uh, 20 people do all the forecasting, cover the financial markets, uh, handle communications, and so on. And these people don't have PhDs, interestingly. Uh, virtually nobody on production has PhDs. Uh, and in fact, many of them are just people with undergraduate degrees. And so we have to kind of, we have to kind of question uh, why can they do this stuff so well, uh, uh, including uh, anchoring of long-term inflation expectations for a little country with 5 million people uh, subject to the kinds of shocks that they have. Uh, uh, they, they do a great job managing the short rent open inflation trade-off and keeping long-term inflation expectations uh, uh, anchored, uh, they do a great job managing the short rent output inflation trade-off. Okay, so we look closely, uh, trying to take the best from the, all the central banks that we thought were the best, uh, geographically and according to our transparency scores. Uh, they're New Zealand, uh, they're the Czech National Bank, uh, and they're the Central Bank of Chile. Okay, so we basically just taken uh, pieces from these central banks and asked, uh, if we were to train people and deploy resources to train people uh, to FPAS Mark II standards, what kind of people would you need? And it turns out uh, this is like uh, jumping on a zip line uh, two in the sense that uh, many of the people uh, that are hired in these institutions uh, have learning styles that are theorist reflectionist. Okay, so these are people. Uh, so this is really interesting because we've gone through this process of uh, trying to train these people. Okay, uh, these Kiwis uh, culturally are uh, very open uh, to this FPAS Mark II stuff, uh, and part of the reason is that uh, they are not afraid about jumping on zip lines, not afraid about making mistakes. Uh, uh, they believe uh, they cooperate. Uh, they have a lot of characteristics that. A lot of us theorists, reflectionists, that uh, like to drive things. We don't like uncertainty, uh, and so on. So we've had to think of a way to teach uh, people that have learning styles that are theorist, reflectionist, how to jump on a zip line and take a little bit of a risk, uh, saying that uh, uh, this is how I think the economy might unfold, and these are the particular arguments, and so on. 
Uh, and for some people, they might think uh, that that is that that storytelling uh, and so on can get a little uh, loosey goosey. So the theorist reflectionists love to have models. Uh, they typically come from academia where you know, there's an inherent bias of thinking the model tells you what the answer is, as opposed to using models uh, to help us think about mapping out uncertainty. And so I'm gonna talk about uh, some models here. Um, we're gonna go into them in detail uh, in a couple of weeks uh, after James Hamilton's talk uh, next week uh, and so on. But I'm gonna give you a little bit of a, an introduction to that. And then Felix is gonna come in and talk about our recent work on uh, consumption functions, one implications it has for thinking about uh, the US outlook. Okay, so first thing, David uh, emphasized this, what is an FPAS uh, Mark I central bank? Uh, well, New Zealand, Chile, and the Czech National Bank are, uh, they, at one point they were a minority, okay? These are central banks that think about uh, the economy in a forward-looking way where they think about where is the economy today? What are the underlying forces driving the economy? And what do my policy instruments need to do to achieve my objectives, okay? So these are like your FPAS Mark I central banks. This is not the Bank of England. This is not the Bank of Japan uh, and so on that formulate forecasts, fudged forecasts, I might add, uh, with exogenous interest rate paths. Okay, so in these uh, central banks, uh, we, we want to have some sort of reaction function. In this case today, I'm going to be talking about a loss function, uh, which is much more robust and uh, explain why and so on. Uh, but they think in terms of where is the economy today? What are the underlying forces? Lots of different scenarios are possible, but there's got to be a something uh, adjusting interest rates to anchor long-term inflation expectations. And those central banks that actually uh, organize their forecast with exogenous interest rates, uh, that analytical framework is not consistent with uh, the basic principles of, of monetary policy regimes that what monetary policy is, is not setting the interest rate, it's adjusting the interest rate sufficiently aggressively to make uh, asset prices and long-term interest rates adjust the things that affect uh, the, the people in the economy uh, that are going to influence uh, prices and uh, wage determination and, and so on. So this is not the Bank of England stuff. This is uh, very extremely transparent. Uh, central banks that are FPAS central banks initially were the minority, but now are, are the central banks that everybody wants to try and emulate. Okay, so let me emphasize uh, that we, we continue to call it FPAS uh, because it shares these uh, fundamental characteristics. Now, how do you do this? This is back a little bit to the uh, theorist reflectionist point. Uh, uh, I think uh, Stan Fisher uh, said it uh, this really nice uh, way where he said, I'd rather have Bob Solo uh, than an econometric model, but I'd rather have Bob Solo uh, with an econometric model than without one, okay? So you can, uh, there's many interpretations of this, but one is uh, that when you're thinking about these things, you need to have a really good economist uh, and it's hard to kind of compartmentalize these questions. And, and when I talk to central banks, what I'm finding is that uh, there was an excessive uh, compartmentalization. So, for example, many central banks that were organized on, according to FPAS uh, Mark I principles would have a lot of people doing now casting and current analysis. And then they would have groups where they'd have modelers and people doing scenarios and that sort of thing. And the, the whole question about how do they pass information back and forth efficiently uh, in the last central bank that we're uh, working with, uh, the person that's ahead of the monetary policy department said that he wants everybody, uh, absolutely everybody that's involved in the FPAS uh, to know about all aspects uh, of it, okay? And who, to have actually gone through a trial projection uh, where they know about all the different aspects. And the idea is that uh, if you're thinking the way that David is trying to, to get us to think, uh, it's really hard to kind of separate uh, the, uh, the analysis. 
uh, things can be happening so quickly because of the Russia-Ukraine war, uh, or there could be different implications about COVID. Uh, when Omicron first hit, we didn't know how virulent it was. And so some countries uh, started shutting down. Uh, and then we learned quickly that it didn't seem to be as virulent, and then they opened up. And so if you're in the middle of a forecast and something like that's happening, uh, another reason for having a different, you know, different scenarios and being able to decompose things into various things. So uh, the summer school uh, that we've uh, dedicated to this. So we've taken uh, F pass bar two and asked, uh, how could we start to teach this uh, in a way to people that are principally theorist reflectionists. Okay, that like to study things where there are just answers, there's right answers and there's wrong answers. Uh, how can we make this uh, an, uh, uh, an enjoyable uh, experience for them? Okay, and uh, we're using actually uh, one of the uh, examples I've taken from New Zealand uh, from this guy named Aaron Drew, uh, who once was on, was doing this workshop with me. And uh, Anyway, he didn't respond to any of the emails that I sent up. I wanted it to be a really good workshop. And he hadn't responded to any of these emails like for weeks and weeks and weeks. And then he finally showed up the night before we're about to do this. And he showed up to the meeting uh, about what we were going to do. And I, I said, uh, you haven't responded to any of my emails in the last several weeks uh, we, because we've been doing all these preparations and stuff. And he said, well, I was, I was on my honeymoon, Doug, and we had agreed that we would not take our iPhones on our honeymoon, okay? And that seemed like a totally uh, uh, sensible explanation. Uh, I wish he would have warned me. But the next thing that he said was that the way that we teach these things are boring. And I said, really, Aaron, they're boring. Uh, what would you suggest to uh, not make them so boring? And he said, what you need to do is to create an environment where people are learning this stuff and they're just sort of throwing in. Uh, they have to like do a forecast uh, this week and present it to a, to a hostile monetary policy committee. He said, that's the way to teach them. Incentivize them to, uh, to actually do it. Uh, and then they can watch themselves, record it, uh, and so on. So uh, that's what we've done. Okay. So uh, the summer school basically has eight weeks to it. Uh, and in each week, uh, we have one course. Uh, and the course uh, has something uh, that's similar in every course. Uh, one thing is this global forecasting school scenario build. Okay? And so this will be a, a menu-driven front end. I'm going to show you about one of the scenarios that uh, has been built with it in a second year. Uh, but it's got a menu-driven front end where uh, people in the Global Forecasting School uh, will meet once a week on Thursdays, okay? And they will talk about all the latest data that have come in We using Python and R uh, to basically assemble it all, all from open source software uh, and so on, like R and Python. And then people will have discussions about uh, different scenarios and people will be able to construct those scenarios effectively solving uh, a uh, nonlinear optimal control problem, uh, which I'm going to talk about uh, in a second. Uh, but the idea is that uh, uh, we'll actually give them the opportunity uh, to generate uh, forecasts for the US economy. So it's like they're not working on their own country. Uh, they're working on uh, something else. Uh, the way that David uh, puts it, he can jump in if he likes, but uh, it's like they're presenting uh, uh, to Powell. And so uh, every week on the basis of the information that's available up to that day, uh, what story would they tell Powell? Okay, And part of this is going to be trying to get away from uh, baseline forecasts, uh, trying to uh, develop what we call case A and case B scenarios, um, scenarios that be help uh, communicate the principles of monetary policy that the fundamental role is to adjust the interest rates sufficiently aggressively to move long-term interest rates and asset prices uh, to be consistent with moving demand conditions in a way that helps uh, stabilize uh, the economy and anchor long-term inflation expectations, of course. Okay, and so 
each one of these courses uh, has some uh, topics. Uh, the first two weeks we do mind the gaps. This is all about measuring the output gap. Uh, and it turns out that the output gap that's relevant for managing the short run open inflation trade-off uh, has nothing to do with the output gap that's relevant for thinking about financial stability, okay? Uh, the, the concepts are completely different uh, and you can really mess up the theory and the econometrics if you don't understand that those things are different. Uh, each course, we'll just talk a little bit about how we use uh, Python and R to do surveillance. In other words, how do we create these reports every day? And also lectures on things like how do we add macro prudential and fiscal policy and the oil market to our canonical models and so on. So, uh, so that's what the first two weeks looked like. Um, each, I said, we'll have this global forecasting uh, system. Um, and uh, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about uh, how this is gonna look. Uh, we're in the process right now of developing a website uh, that's gonna have a user-friendly uh, experience. Uh, we say user-friendly front end now, but, uh, but now it's, it's, a, it's a good experience, okay? But, so what I'm gonna show you is incredibly rough, but you'll get an idea of what's, what we're doing here. So you go back to uh, March before the meeting, uh, you looked at the Fed fund futures. Uh, they were going up to like 2%, <laughs> you know, and, and you, uh, many of us, uh, in fact, if you go back to the Better Policy Project seminars, we're very skeptical. Uh, we were all thinking that inflation is going to end up higher and interest rates are going to, uh, there's a risk that obviously interest rates can go much, much higher. Still today, okay, as we're going to see. Uh, but uh, if you just go, what happened? Uh, well, obviously we had some big surprises, uh, uh, the Ukraine uh, war, uh, China, COVID, uh, lots of things happened and the curve has shifted up. So this is the last observation, uh, the light blue line. And you see it peaks now, it used to peak around 2% okay, uh, in this dream world. Uh, and now uh, it peaks at uh, about 325 basis points, okay? Um, and so the, obviously there's concerns about inflation. Now, what we have uh, for constructing these interest rate paths, as well as paths for the 10-year bond rate, um, the output gap, uh, and underlying core inflation uh, is basically a mixed complementarity problem. So we have a quadratic objective function for US monetary policy that's very asymmetric. Uh, it's, uh, we're writing a paper right now showing that if you tried, if you tried this at an emerging market, you would be in a very bad, a very bad situation because the model has uh, endogenous policy credibility. Okay, so the way that credibility works in the model is that credibility is easier to lose uh, than to gain once you've lost it. Uh, put another way, uh, long-term inflation expectations can ratchet up. They could also ratchet down too, uh, both possibilities. Uh, but long-term inflation expectations can ratchet up. And if that results in higher indexation, uh, either through inflation expectations or through wage price setting processes, uh, which would be the, the second layer if it was very, very uh, persistent. Uh, and so this, this modeling strategy basically starts off with an objective function. A reaction function doesn't work uh, because obviously your reaction of interest rates is gonna depend on how much credibility you have. Uh, so in this model, you have to raise interest rates more uh, once, you've, once you've lost credibility in response to stagflationary shocks and so on. Uh, and uh, in addition to that, uh, what makes it a mixed complementarity problem is that there's an occasionally binding constraint. And so in this case, it's the effect of lower bound on interest rates. Now this is uh, uh, what uh, case B, this would be an example of a case B uh, scenario. And it's one of the things that we teach uh, in our course uh, to always start a forecast off and understand what's in it. Okay, so this, this is kind of like the beginning of a forecast uh, before st someone starts to uh, uh, refine it, okay? And so just let me tell you, uh, what the, you know, what the story is here. Uh, so 
there's uncertainty about what underlying inflation is in the United States right now. Okay, so uh, various measures will give you different uh, numbers. Uh, many of them are centered around 5%. Okay, so the core inflation number that came out uh, in April about an hour ago, uh, it was up month on month by 0.6%. Okay, so just do something very crude and multiply that by 12 and it's 7.2 annualized. Then of course it would be higher than that if we really annualized it. So that's a little bit more than the 5% here, okay? Uh, but I'm gonna assume that underlying inflation is 5% in this scenario. And this is going to be the immaculate disinflation that you get out of a standard DSGE model, okay? That has, <laughs> makes a very strong presumption of credibility. Okay, that basically expectations are anchored by the 2% target, okay, which is what comes out of your standard DSG model if you did, weren't going to do anything uh, to incorporate more plausible assumptions about expectations. Okay? So the immaculate uh, disinflation. So inflation, we have two measures of your core, quarter on quarter, and then year on year, and you can see it just uh, declines Quarter on quarter is down uh, below 3% uh, within a few quarters, okay? Uh, uh, certainly well before the end of the year. The Fed funds rate uh, goes up to about uh, uh, 2%. Uh, remember I showed you uh, back in March. Uh, the open gap, we assume in the immaculate uh, disinflation uh, that the open gap starts off at zero, okay? Uh, in this, which is approximately what, uh, Congressional Budget Office, uh, you know, would have us believe they haven't made any big adjustments to uh, uh, to potential because of COVID. Okay, and that's really important to understand that in their estimates. Reserve Bank of New Zealand, going back to that, they did make uh, explicit adjustments uh, to potential. Another reason why we uh, why we give the Reserve Bank of New Zealand such high marks. So the reason that the open gap is positive initially is that monetary conditions uh, are, are really easy, okay? So the Fed funds rate, the real Fed funds rate uh, is negative, okay? And that's what uh, uh, creates the froth uh, in the economy in this uh, scenario. And you can see that in, in this scenario, uh, because, because inflation falls, credibility is one. So you see there's a graph, Fed credibility, uh, it's equal to one. <laughs> uh, so the full model has endogenous credibility, okay? And we're just imposing it in this scenario to be equal to one. And so this is an example, uh, the 10 year bond rate uh, in this case would be 2.2, okay? So it is now around three. Uh, it has increased massively uh, since uh, March and so on. So this, uh, for example, this would be an example of, of what I would call a, a case B scenario. Okay, this is my case B scenario, uh, which is the immaculate uh, uh, disinflation, uh, which is virtually costless, and would just have you know suggest that. And some people have this view, which is uh, what David is is trying to emphasize, and it could, and it could turn out uh, that this this view is actually correct. Uh, I personally uh, don't think it's correct, uh, but but there is uh, outcomes that could happen that that where something like this could happen. Uh, now, of course, this would be uh, case B. Uh, case B would be a situation where uh, interest rates uh, are rising by less than what's in financial markets. And then you would have case A, which would always be reserved for a case where interest rates would have to rise by more than in financial markets, than what's in the, uh, this one, what's in, uh, expected path of the policy rate. So that's an example. So uh, people have a menu driven uh, front end and they'll be able to choose uh, 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 what they think the starting point for the US economy is, what underlying inflation is. Uh, they'll be able to pick a, pick a number. Uh, they'll be able to pick the starting point for the, the amount of excess demand, uh, the difference between aggregate demand and aggregate supply in the goods market. That's how we think about it, <laughs> okay. And they'll be able to pick 
uh, various assumptions about shocks, where shocks are classified into two types. Um, you have demand and supply shocks, uh, where aggregate demand can rise by a different amount than aggregate supply. And then you have these stagflationary shocks where uh, inflation doesn't go up and you have to raise interest rates. So this is where the loss function now is, is efficiently managing that short route output uh, inflation trade-off. Okay? And again, because you have the loss function, the paths for the interest rates are, <laughs> are, are believable, uh, much more plausible than what you would get out of any linear uh, reaction function. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> what's new in FPAS Mark II? Uh, more emphasis on studying the policy implications of uncertainty with scenarios uh, to avoid what Olivier Blanchard calls uh, dark corners. Um, much better delineation between views about, uh, you know, what is the people's views about the economy? How, how do the policymakers think about the economy? What's the state of, of credibility? Uh, how persistent uh, is the inflation uh, process and so on? First is uncertainty about policy objectives, right? Because we want to, uh, by developing these frameworks and by getting policymakers to buy into them, uh, it's, it's going to reduce uncertainty, uh, particularly if we can get them to focus on, on much more robust uh, loss functions and so on. And of course, uh, more financial accelerators uh, to look at uh, macro financial policies and so on, just other things. Uh, including open source uh, software. Uh, so just to uh, to go on to the main uh, uh, the main topic today, we're going to come back to some of those things later. Uh, Felix, maybe you can uh, take over uh, on your screen, share your screen, and then and then and then take over the. the uh, I will, um, do I open? Do I have to open the slides at my end? I guess so. Yes. Let me let me quickly do that. Um, well, Nafi, I just saw you. Uh, welcome. And Hayek, nice to see Irene. Sorry, I didn't see all these people. Paul, nice to see you back. Um, while I'm opening the slides, maybe I can just give a little bit of an um, introduction uh, to myself and how Doug <laughs> and David and I all know each other. So I... Um, as David mentioned, we were both at the Reserve Bank of New Zealand. In fact, David was the chief economist um, at the RBNZ uh, when, I, when I started my career there. So I vividly remember David welcoming me when I was an intern and then when I stayed on as a um, graduate analyst. So he was effectively my boss. Um, and I cut my teeth on FPAS Mark I. I was actually in the modeling team uh, at the Reserve Bank of New Zealand before I went on to the international um, forecasting division. So, so the, 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 that's indeed a very sort of familiar uh, world to me. Um, but what happened then is that our, our paths diverged quite a lot. So eventually um, uh, I felt that I needed a break from, as, as Doug put it, the reflectionist theorist view of the world. I wanted more uh, color, I wanted more um, uh, detail and more sort of pragmatic um, uh, uh, exposure. And so I went off into the private sector. Um, and so initially I, uh, initially, I worked for a um, in a in a macro research team for an Australian um, investment bank, um, and then I went off to the EIU, um, the the Economist Intelligence Unit. Um, and so, what I found there is um, we uh, that that that's taking us back to before F plus Mark One. So, in the private sector, um, even F plus Mark One is is very rare. So um, since I left the RBNZ, I've been in the world uh, that, that David described before F plus Mark I came into being. In other words, um, econometric equations linked by accounting identities distributed across lots of spreadsheets. Um, and uh, what that means for people in the private sector is uh, we desperately want to explore scenarios um, so we, uh, we deal with uh, policy makers and all kinds of other decision makers. 
Um, and of course, we know that um, thinking through scenarios is, is the most useful way in which we can help them plan. But we really struggle to do that because we, um, we don't have the tools to make it easy to think through complexity in, a, in an efficient way. Um, and also, while we, while we try to have Bob solos um, on our teams, uh, without these frameworks, it becomes really difficult to train Bob solos uh, in an easy way. And that's particularly relevant for um, the EIU, um, because what we're trying to do there is integrate um, politics and economics into our scenarios and into our forecasts. So effectively, we're asking our staff to be um, Henry Kissinger's as well as Bob Solo's and being both of those things is really difficult. So um, we're thinking about new ways of doing things at the EIU at the moment. And that's why I got in touch with Doug um, about a year ago. Um, and uh, we're very interested in being a pioneer in the private sector in terms of uh, moving to uh, not just F plus Mark I, but also F plus, plus Mark II and going beyond uh, uh, baseline forecast to a much more uh, nimble and responsive suite of scenarios that we can give to our clients. So, so that's just a bit of background on me. And that's, that's going to um, affect a little bit how I present what I'm going to talk about now. So um, a group of us um, started to get interested in thinking about the, um, the possible scenarios for how the economy might get back to normal after a very abnormal period um, during COVID. So, so the, this work would have started late last year. Um, economies were heading out of the pandemic. And the question was, what would happen um, as, as things normalize? Um, and the way that we explored this, or well, actually the way in which Doug and his team explored it, I've, I've been a, um, I, I've, I've definitely not done most of the work here. Um, the way they explored it is, is through, a, a, through a traditional consumption function, uh, which again takes you back to the pre f pass Mark I way of thinking about things. Now, if I'd done this work when I was at my bank uh, or even at the EIU, I would think it was amazing work. Um, it's, uh, it, it really um, uh, takes the, the, the traditional consumption function in, in really useful new directions. Um, and as you'll see, we're not using an econo econometric model here in an old school, the model says way, we're using it in a, in a, a smart and creative way, but nonetheless, uh, it doesn't answer some really important questions that we're wanting to answer when we're actually forecasting. So you'll see some really good work, but it'll also leave you with lots of questions that you'll need an F plus Mark II system to answer. So, um, this is the group of people who've been involved uh, in, 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 in various ways uh, in this project. As I say, I've, been, I've not been at the center of it, but I've been uh, privileged to be part of it uh, from the beginning. Uh, and uh, another health warning, um, I said it a second ago, um, we're definitely not taking a model and using it as a machine to generate an answer. Um, we're, using, we're looking at uh, to what extent can this model help us uh, understand what we know and what we don't know and what the possibilities might be. Okay, so, uh, so what was the motivation for all of this? As I said, it was all about trying to think about how, um, how the US economy in particular uh, might look heading out of COVID. And we were really conscious um, about the extent to which um, the COVID period was an economic and financial anomaly. So of course, uh, first and foremost, we were thinking about the fact that um, asset prices, um, financial asset prices, but also property prices had, had really rocketed up during a major national crisis. Um, raising the question 
of, of, of what things would happen uh, once the economy exited the crisis. And you can see here, um, I mean, of course, now we've already had a, a partial correction since the, um, the, the, the war in Ukraine. Um, but even so, the NASDAQ composite is still well above where it was um, before, before COVID began. So, you know, compared to February 2020, um, before the WHO uh, declared a global pandemic, and we're still a fair bit higher. So there's a big question of uh, how much further down uh, could this go and under what circumstances. Now, that, that sort of um, striking uh, state of affairs um, didn't happen in a vacuum. There were some other very unusual things that, um, that contributed to it. Uh, one was the enormous fiscal expansion. So in the US, um, between them, the Trump administration and the, 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 the Biden administration, um, uh, injected uh, more than 10% of US GDP um, into the economy in a bid to um, keep um, the most vulnerable parts of the economy afloat, uh, financially afloat through the pandemic. Um, put another way, the flip side of this asset price uh, run up has been a, 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 an equally large run up in public debt. Um, in the US, the federal debt is more than 20% of GDP higher than it was um, in 2019. So that's uh, one other um, factor that's played a role in this. Second one, of course, is the extraordinary amount of monetary easing uh, in part done to enable this fiscal expansion um, from already very, very loose levels. Um, interest rate cuts to zero, quantitative easing, uh, macroprudential easing, um, one very nice uh, way to summarize all of this um, is to remember the, um, the transversality condition or the no Ponzi game condition that we all learned about in our financial macro. So if, you're, if your real interest rate is below your, 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 your real growth rate on a sustained basis, then your, your asset prices become potentially completely unanchored and you start to get the possibility of, um, of financial bubbles. Well, we've been in that territory for quite a while now. Um, so, uh, so one possibility um, is that those high asset prices are, are very unsustainable indeed. Um, uh, just, uh, I, I think this is a, a really, really cool chart um, that Doug and his team put together. Um, the, 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 the baseline here, the gray line, which divides, let's call them sort of bubble territory from non-bubble territory, um, that's not completely arbitrary. So we, uh, we chose that to um, coincide with the period when um, Alan Greenspan first talked about pockets of irrational exuberance in the US financial system all the way back in the mid 1990s. Um, so if we look at where we are currently, of course, it completely dwarfs um, both the dot-com uh, boom and the free GFC boom. Uh, so adding to the, 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 the questions about where, where asset prices uh, might go. Um, and the last factor, which played a really big role in, uh, in driving up um, uh, asset prices and, and then sort of in the, in the general nature of the, uh, the way the economy behaved during COVID was, of course, the massive increase in, 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 in household savings during this period. Uh, and some of this was uh, precautionary saving um, and liquidity constraints, uh, but a lot of it was also something very, very uh, unusual, which is the, uh, the fact that large parts of the economy were lock locked down. Uh, and so people really couldn't spend on, on the things that they normally spent, uh, particularly in retail. Um, so a lot of that liquidity injection ended up going into, into assets and asset prices instead. Now, just by looking at the the sort of relationship between disposable income um, and consumption, you can see just how unusual 
um, the, the last couple of years were, suggesting that if you, if you try to analyze that period through the lens of, um, of sort of normal behavior, um, you wouldn't get very far. Um, so, so this this sort of inverse uh, behavior of, of of real consumption, real disposable income, has has, has really been seen very very rarely, um, and of course it is a reflection um, of the lockdowns, um, and even more so when you consider just how much uh, the rise in asset prices through the last two years has has has, uh, has stimulated um, household wealth. Uh, in the US, of course, very unequally, but in aggregate, um, uh, net financial wealth um, has increased by, by an enormous amount uh, since the start of the pandemic. So, uh, so what we've done in this, 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 so, uh, this working, sorry, Doug, am I going on for yeah, too long? I just wanted to, I just wanted to ask people. Um, so net wealth has risen uh, from the fourth quarter of 2019, okay, uh, to the fourth quarter of, uh, of last year, okay, uh, it has risen by $35 trillion, okay? I, I, uh, does everybody know how big that number is? Does everybody know, like, the US economy is uh, $22 trillion. $22, $23 trillion economy, okay? And so the increase in the value of household wealth because of the increase in equity prices, okay? Now, there's been a 20% correction, for example, since the end of the year in the NASDAQ, but it's been $35 trillion. This is like mind boggling, hmm. okay? Uh, now, it hasn't turned into leverage, if it were to turn into, uh, if people were to start to, to borrow against that and, and consume, uh, things would be, uh, you know, potentially very risky. A uh, year or two years, you know, we could be at a, a gigantic Minsky moment. Okay? So, but I just wanted to, the 35 trillion, I don't think you, uh, uh, you, you maybe played up quite, uh, quite as much as, uh, as we should. Uh, people don't talk about it. It's a, Absolutely, mind staggering. No. Yes, and of course, this is this is well. It's in the it, it, it's it's in the world's biggest economy, but but you know this happened in other major economies as well. So this was a global phenomenon, and uh, and I, I guess from from a more sort of political EIU point of view, um, yes, leverage has been low, but but of course there's been a lot of financial repression. Um, through this period. So what we've also seen is a massive increase in wealth inequality. Um, and so, so, you know, then, then, there's, a, then there's additional questions uh, about what that means for, 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 for political stability um, and what that might mean for international political risks as well. So there are, there are, there are, there are all kinds of ramifications of this chart, which are, which are potentially um, quite, quite, quite worrying, um, even if we don't think that there's another global financial crisis around the corner. Um, but, but I guess taking this back to how do you, how do you think about um, this phenomenon um, and, what, and, and how it might unfold using different, different methodologies? So, so as I said, we, we, uh, we looked at whether what we could get out of what's basically a pre- an econometric approach um, to this. And if there's any, um, any econometric relationship that should give you some insights, um, it's the consumption function because there are few relationships, at least for the US, which are as strong and tight and robust um, as the traditional consumption function. Um, you can see that on, on this uh, chart here incredibly tight relationship, uh, really, really good diagnostics, very high R squared, low errors. Um, now, of course, that does not mean that this is a causal relationship. Um, very probably there's, there's uh, uh, common factors going on, things like, uh, you know, the, 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 the credit cycle and the financial cycle, which is uh, pushing up um, 
consumption and, and, and asset prices and, and, and sort of easing liquidity constraints and so on all at the same time. But the fact is, it's it, just empirically, it's been very robust um, uh, up to the uh, up to the up to the pandemic, and so you might want to um, exploit that when you're thinking about uh, what's going to happen after the pandemic. Now, of course, during the pandemic, um, as we saw in the just in the in the simple uh, graphs of the data, um, the economy hasn't behaved. Uh, like uh, according to the consumption function at all, because we had um, income and wealth rise and we had savings rate increase a lot. Um, but what we what, but what 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 you can potentially do is to say, uh, what if uh, the economy had continued to follow the path of the consumption function? Um, what would consumption had looked like? given what happened to wealth and incomes? And then can we interpret um, the, 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 the gap between what actually happened um, and that counterfactual as a quantification of pent up demand? And can we use that um, in, in, our, in our forecasting? Um, and the answer basically is um, yes, that's a, that, that, that's, a, that's a great sort of thing to do. And it really helps quantify um, the, 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 the level of saving compared to what might have happened otherwise. Um, but when we try to actually apply that in forecasting, we still end up with lots and lots of unknowns um, and it only takes us so far. Um, so we, we also expand, we, we, we try to model out um, this, uh, this, this level of pent up demand um, or this gap um, between um, predicted consumption and what actually happened um, in a way that um, makes a lot of sense and is, is sort of motivated by what we know about the period. So we, we found two indicators um, that matched um, this residual um, really well in combination. So one is a measure of, you could say, precautionary saving due to economic uncertainty. And that's the Google trend measure of unemployment searches. Um, and the second one is the uh, Google mobility measure in, in the retail and recreational sector, which, uh, which, which really uh, goes a long way to capturing uh, the impact of, uh, of, of lockdowns um, and social distancing measures, which affected uh, the retail sector. Uh, more than other sectors. So, so this is very, very suggestive, um, but of course, it only gives us um, information um, going back, as you can see here, uh, to the start of the pandemic. So there's not even a lot of statistical information to go on to say how this relates to wider economic activity. Um, and we know that these are proxies for more complex uh, complex phenomena. So, so, this is, so what we're doing here, the kind of work that, that, that a really good economist at a private sector bank um, or at the EIU might have done, it's very suggestive and it's helpful, um, but we still have to do a lot of thinking uh, and make a lot of judgments when we, uh, when we apply this to creating a forecast. Um, so what are some of the questions that we still have to answer, which this work does not help us answer. Well, we have to um, think about what will happen to asset prices. So we need to take a view on the extent to which um, US asset prices are in a bubble. Uh, we have to think about the drivers of disposable income. So um, the fiscal stance, to what extent uh, uh, will, will the fiscal stance change? Uh, to what extent will um, the federal debt uh, weigh on fiscal spending. We have to think about the stance of monetary policy. At the moment, we now have to think about global uh, inflation shocks and what they mean for real disposable income. Um, even if we know all of those things, we still have to make a judgment on the extent to which that pent-up demand that we've estimated um, 
gets unwound um, uh, over the next uh, year or two. Um, and then there's completely new shocks that might come along, uh, like new COVID variants and new lockdowns. So really, um, with, with, the, with the best kind of analysis, without an FPAS Mark II system, we are still left with, 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 with a lot of questions about the future and are starting to having to conclude that the world is indeed unforecastable. So having a, 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 a system that helps you think through all of those, the way all of those determinants uh, might, might, might evolve and what, what uncertainties we really need to care about would be incredibly useful. Um, so, Doug, that's my take on the work that we've done and how it relates to FPAS uh, Mark II. And hopefully I, uh, it's, it's stimulated some thoughts about the kinds of um, scenarios we might want to um, explore in the coming weeks. Okay, good. Um, I'll just let me uh, try to share my screen. Can I get, uh, I, I need to share my screen, please. Yeah, I'll stop sharing my screen now. Um, okay, so uh, it'd be nice if we could uh, get a little bit of discussion. So uh, somebody asked, for example, uh, are they ordinary least squares? Can you see my screen? Yes, yes, we can yeah. see. So, so Slash asked, are they ordinary least squares? Okay, so this is a great topic, okay? So uh, Felix said, uh, that we're not viewing this as a as a as necessarily a, a, a relationship based on one way causation. Okay, uh, so we're we're just uh, uh, people that know uh, macroeconomics and that know the story about U.S. consumption functions. Okay, will realize that there's this equation that fits really well. That if you just put consumption, disposable income, and wealth in it. Okay. Uh, it fits really well, okay? And so we're, uh, we're kind of playing into that. Now we would like in our structural models, we would like to be able to generate that kind of behavior, okay? Because it fits so well, okay? So, uh, and so uh, we, we're, we're just not, uh, we moved on. F pass mark one is not about estimating these econometrics like David mm -hmm. Henry and stuff where you try to find, uh, uh, the, cause the, the the relationship, the econometric, the backward looking econometric relationship, the quest to do that has been a complete failure. So we're not doing that. Uh, we're just saying that we know the macro time series literature and this, there's this relationship that is really stable, the consumption function. It's like, it's like Oaken's law. Okay, so that's how we're thinking about it. So we're not worried about uh, uh, that whether or not there's simultaneity bias, we know there is simultaneity bias. Consumption and disposable income are almost the same thing. <laughs> okay, in this sense, uh, uh, when you understand how the economy works, uh, uh, those things uh, contemporaneously are, are, are very much uh, connected. And obviously asset prices at any theory are also very much uh, connected. Okay, so um, I, like in just in terms of the history of modeling, uh, you know, we don't buy this, uh, this Oxfordian view or, L or LSE view about building models with econometrics, okay? What we do is we use econometrics uh, to tell stories uh, when there are relationships like Oaken's law or consumption functions and so on, okay? So Lasha, did that answer your question <clears throat> about why, uh, why we don't care? Uh, we also don't first difference, right? Like the fit, the R squared is 0.999, and we don't first difference uh, uh, because we're not worried about uh, these being random variables with unit roots. Uh, so we're just using this as a way of, of telling the story, okay? But is that is it sort of clear, Lasha, what we're doing here? Um, yes, yes, thank you. Okay, sorry. Um, so uh, one, possibility for the consumption functions to start fitting again um, is if equity price is correct, okay? Uh, and so that's, that's, uh, that's one of the reasons why I think this function works so well, right? Because uh, if you think that there are things that can shift it, like precautionary saving, 
um, are those things that are going to be big, the big level drivers of consumption should still be disposable income and wealth, and there should just be some shifters. And some of those shifters could be, uh, uh, could be permanent uh, and so on. But, but Miriam, you did the work, uh, and, uh, and I'm sure David and, uh, and others uh, have reflections about what it might be uh, and so on. But uh, yeah. do you have any I will add from my side, if, if you can hear me, just like uh, what we just see here, we'll be explaining details into our paper as well, which was presented. Uh, but besides this, uh, this canonical consumption function, which was described into details by Felix, we also did some uh, assumptions regarding the real interest rates. And we impose, by imposing some assumptions, we did, uh, we made the kind of analysis based on extended consumption function as well. All of these results, what we saw, really showed us very good fit and um, showed us some plausible results, which again will be um, explained in our paper. This is kind of spoiler what I'm doing now uh, for our future um, paper. And also what you see here now, what Doug uh, has shown now is just the result of the regression and analysis based on two additional variables. Uh, as you see here, we try to explain on different stages what could be the reason of the prediction error, which we saw uh, during the period of COVID. And this prediction error is not as bad thing as we just uh, could imagine because based on this prediction error, we just somehow measure this pent up demand. The difference between like the fitted consumption function and actual consumption function. Then we decided to somehow uh, explain what could be the reason of this uh, reduced consumption. And as you see on the second stages, we uh, exactly added some additional variables as Felix also mentioned and Doug also mentioned. And you see the result, the result that given these additional variables like uh, Google trend of unemployment searches, which we kind of uh, use as a proxy to measure the fear of unemployment by people. And also in addition to this uh, Google trend data, we also use some Google mobility data to explain what caused this drop in consumption. And you'll see that both proxies really helped us to explain our residual, our, the drop in the consumption function, consumption during the COVID period. So the results are really plausible as you see. And uh, as Doug mentioned, we are not trying to explain everything from like econometric views. We are trying to explain everything from macro views. Uh, and um, again, from my side, what I would add that details will be also added in our paper. <laughs> So, so, for example, the consumption function here, okay, yeah. doesn't doesn't include a real interest rate term, okay, or anything, case, yes. or or anything that would complete the transmission mechanism, okay. So, if, if you believed in an endogenous money creation view, okay, which would be very much consistent with these really strong and stable correlations, but you would also have something in there on credit conditions, like. So if credit conditions are really easy, people are getting loans and they can finance expenditures and so on. Um, and, but econometrically, if you try to put the real interest rate in it over a sample where monetary policy has been working against shocks, in this case, supporting the economy because it's been weak okay, with, with low real interest rates, okay, it's going to be impossible uh, to identify the the causal relationship between real interest rates and, and consumption funds. This is why the econometric approach doesn't work, right? Uh, uh, starting off with this idea that things are zero, that they're not there. So we put the real interest rate effect in, okay? Uh, and all it does is uh, change the amount of uh, pent up demand, make it instead of 3%, it ends up being 4% uh, and so on. If you put in plausible estimates of what the effects on the real interest rate are and so on. Uh, so you can, uh, the other thing too, is that if you look at the residual, you look at really nice and noisy and stuff. Uh, uh, okay, like, yeah, I'm talking about the residual after 
after you put in uh, Google Mobility and, uh, and uh, that Google Mobility thing, uh, re the retail uh, and recreational mobility, which proxies for the effects of people's reaction to COVID, either through uh, implementing more stringent measures or for some countries, uh, people just taking precautionary, uh, uh, not, going, not going to the restaurant or the gym uh, uh, because of the fear of COVID, okay? Well, there's seasonality in that. And when we were going, this is actually quite fascinating, an example of networking and sharing and stuff like this. Uh, when we were going through this in real time, with COVID data, monitoring the retail and recreational, people suggested uh, that this might be seasonal. <laughs> so I remember the big story that COVID, yeah, it's sort of like the polls. Uh, people are closed up, uh, confined, uh, versus out, out and about. Uh, so there could be a seasonal component here. And so we've been working on uh, extending uh, this stuff, incorporating the effects of COVID uh, into our estimates, our historical estimates, uh, in a way to make sure that everything's cleaned up. Okay? Like we can clean up uh, the COVID stuff uh, uh, rigorously. Uh, Pat Higgins is gonna be here on, uh, on June 29th. Uh, talking about GDP now, okay, and we're going to try and organize uh, sessions to make, try to make GDP now global. In other words, not just do the U.S. economy, but but to follow a similar methodology for other economies. We'll be using what is what we call uh, a Bayesian hierarchy methods, okay, and these are just wonderful methods. Like we have a, a course on this uh, because what you can do uh, is when you interpret things like uh, a new event like COVID, uh, you can actually just treat that event in your country uh, to have to be uh, the same phenomena <laughs> that is happening in other countries. Mm. Okay? So by, by actually using information about other countries, okay, uh, to condition things like the obvious seasonal uh, component. So that residual or consumption function might end up uh, being cleaned up as we clean up the data, okay, and uh, seasonally adjust COVID, again, with a couple of years of observations. How do you do that? Well, you use information uh, across countries about what this, you know, what that characteristic is. So the, so I just wanted to put a plug in, uh, watch out, Miriam and I are, are working on this and, and it's going to show up in our, in one of our courses uh, that is in August. So, um, so very good. Um, I, just wanted to, uh, so did anyone, uh, David, uh, are you in the consumption functions or? Yeah, let, let me just try and connect up um, some of the things that we've talked about so far, because I think it's a fascinating, <clears throat> some fascinating things coming out, which can illustrate some of the points I, I, I want to keep in front of people. So Doug, uh, um, gave us a kind of a, a teaser introduction to uh, an online forecasting system, which has got some fascinating uh, characteristic in terms of some of the interesting non-linearities in the system. He illustrated it with some some lines, um, which came out of a particular scenario, which he um, labelled the like the immaculate conception scenario or words like that. So that was. He chose the words, obviously, in order to kind of rubbish this particular scenario, like this can't happen, this is totally unrealistic. Um, and then said, well, you know, a more plausible thing is something different. Um, uh, and labelled the, the, the immaculate conception one, the case B scenario in terms of reference scenarios you might use to help think through your policy options. Then um, Felix took us through um, a whole bunch of things which gave us many places where we might want to start thinking about, hey, hang on, that case B might not be so implausible after all. So a few points at which, um, at which Felix suggested or indicated factors that might um, 
make case B a whole lot more plausible. One is this transversality uh, problem we've, we've had um, uh, in the generation of asset price bubbles. So there are mass, potentially there are massive asset price bubbles which uh, require something to um, prick them, to make them implode. Um, lots of difficult things are coming along in front of us. Um, if asset prices collapse um, um, with a lot of fear generated by that, uh, there's, it wouldn't be that surprising to see uh, the, the, the drop in household savings, which has been happening reverse course again, uh, and um, some difficult times be ahead of us. We're seeing already a lot of early warning indicators of recession coming, a lot of people talking about the possibility of confronting stagflation problems and so on. So that all fits to a story where, you know, it could well be that um, interest rates don't have to go up very far before they have to reverse course uh, and start cushioning the blow and supporting the economy. Another thing that uh, Felix showed us, which was also um, goes in the same direction, uh, is the amount of fiscal support that was there in order to hold consumption up, hold the economy up. Um, and that fiscal support was uh, relatively easily provided when real interest rates were incredibly low. But if it turns out um, that, you know, the, 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 the political costs of trying to generate more fiscal support uh, to cushion a blow of some sort. Uh, it just is, it, it's implausible when, when the, debt, the, the cost of financing existing debt, which is massively expanded, um, makes the options of not raising taxes um, uh, really not a, not, a, not a feasible option. So the fiscal stance could switch in the other direction. I mean, a fiscal, uh, the, the payback time on how much uh, debt expansion has occurred could be kind of there at about the same time as asset price bubbles uh, get pricked and implode. Now, these are, these are, uh, Things that we have seen in history, these are not totally implausible uh, phenomena. So it, it's not that difficult to tell a story where the case B is a story that a policymaker might want to be thinking about. Because even if they position interest rates on the basis that a case A story of needing to rise interest, raise interest rates sufficiently far to at least stop them being deeply negative real interest rates uh, in a context of, uh, of households whose inflation expectations have suddenly become relevant again because they've kind of woken up from a deep slumber. Or they're, they're no longer rationally inattentive. They're now becoming attentive. That might be the case, a scenario which people are somewhat more scared about, but... Uh, it's uh, a sensible policymaker would also think about, you know, what if things turn around uh, with some of these events um, that are on the cards already actually flow through in that particular way? I think through what interest rates would need to do in those circumstances and then do the risk analysis. Um. Okay, um, perfect. I just want to shift back and notice Jose's here about um, about creating these scenarios um, in this global forecasting school. Uh, so this is your chance uh, yes. to provide us uh, uh, any guidance, all of you, uh, about how you might think a user uh, a friendly front end would look like. But what we're thinking about. Uh, is that you would look at a, a picture, okay? Uh, and it would be separated into pictures of hawks and doves, okay? So hawks uh, would be scenarios that would require a much higher uh, path for the policy rate. And obviously long-term interest rates would be, would be much higher. Uh, and doves where uh, 
the arguments uh, in this scenario would point to much uh, lower interest rates and therefore lower long-term uh, interest rates and so on. And the idea is that uh, people would get together and, and create these scenarios. And then we would create little videos uh, where they would uh, uh, effectively try to make an argument uh, why that scenario was interesting. Okay, And uh, everybody has to produce a, a case A at a case B. Uh, so in this matrix, they have to produce something that's both a, a dove uh, and a hawk. Uh, and then eventually, uh, people will be able to look at all this stuff visually uh, and just kind of focus in on what they think the risks are. Or they'll be able to combine, like, for example, uh, if you like uh, David's story and you like uh, parts of uh, uh, my story, uh, you might be able to say, well, I, I, I buy these parts in the story, but I don't buy these other parts. And, and we would then be able to uh, decompose things to take those parts out. And then you would uh, associate yourself with a different case, say, and a different uh, case B. But, but Jose, what is your, we've gotten reactions, Hayek. Uh, we've gotten reactions from you, uh, Hayek, about this case A and case B that David is uh, pointed to. But what about teaching it to people? Because Hayek, you want everybody on your staff uh, to know how to do this stuff. Uh, what is your views about case A and case B, Jose and, and Hayek yeah. and Alberta and so on? Well, first, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. I think it's a, a wonderful idea. I think one of the most difficult parts for economies working at, at the technical staff at central bank is to construct plausible ex scenarios and to construct a plausible narratives that can be used in the policy making process and, and discussion. So I think that like, I have never seen like something like that, like that, this kind of training that you are, uh, you are proposing. So I, I think it's great, it's a great opportunity for for economies to, to train in, in this um, element that is, uh, I, I, I may say that it, is, it, it always had been important, but I think the relevance now, uh, given the kind of shocks that we're experiencing in the world, uh, make it more relevant. And it's really useful uh, for policymakers um, to have access to, to this kind of, of analysis. And it's important for, for the, the central bank staff to know how to construct this scenario. So I think that the idea is, is, is great. Um, and, and I really think that uh, it is a, a really nice to go uh, to understand intuition and to having like those two, two X scenarios, I think are uh, to having like a, a, a dovish and a hawkish stance, I think they will work great. I just may add one thing that, that I always mention based on on my experience, and this is completely my view, that I think is important is um, that is crucial when you're doing these scenarios, when uh, first to know where the shock is coming from. Sometimes you just create like scenarios that are just like the world is bad, but you don't know what is creating like the external look, external outlook looks bad. So the, the first thing is uh, you need to stop and thinking what is the shock that is creating uh, your, your risk scenario. And then you have to think about the magnitude of this shock. That is the second, the, the second uh, part. And the third part is the persistence of the shock. Uh, so that, that is something that at least for me has, has worked in, in my professional experience. And the other thing that I think is useful to, to, to think, and I think the framework that, that you're proposing will work great for this, is that sometimes you only need to assess like sensitivity of one variable to your X scenario. Um, but other times you need to construct like a plausible narrative uh, of something that you consider that is a risk that you, you, you need to assess. So distinguishing when you are doing your, this uh, sensitive uh, scenarios between those that you really need a narrative for them also, I, I, I might find it uh, useful. And I think like a really nice example for what I've seen in our central banks is, is the way that they do it in Chile. I think it's a really nice experience of, of how they do it and how they communicate that in their uh, monetary policy report. So I, I think this will be great and, and I'm looking forward to, to have ch a chance to participate on that. 
Yeah, I, I just wanted to go back to a couple of things. One is <clears throat> the training. How do you train people to do this? Okay, when you have theorists, reflectionists, and so on. Uh, that's one aspect. Then there's the part about the policy. Um, like if you have case B and case uh, A, uh, uh, how does that improve the policymaking process? I think the answer clearly is yes. Are there any communication challenges that you think, uh, that anybody thinks? Uh, because those are the only two criteria that we, uh, uh, can we help the policymakers uh, deliberate and communicate more efficiently? Um, and so any reflections on that? Uh, we know David would say yes at the both counts, I think. Uh, but anybody else, Jose, do you have any uh, comments about uh, what this might mean for other training or, or thinking about uh, the actual policymaking process and communications? Yes, I, I think that for at least for training, I think it's perfect because if you start like putting like too many options, probably it will be complicated. So just just trying to to disentangle better the, the chuck. So so I think like in the training having a limited set of options, I think is beneficial for, for when you're trying to teach and for someone that is trying to learn. In my view. Um, for, for policymakers, and I think that will work in that setting, like for training, for policymakers, what I think a little bit more complicated and, and then it's when you cannot have like these two scenarios is because sometimes you have, um, or in your risk scenario, you just have to balance things out. Like sometimes you have forces that create appreciation and appreciation as, at the same time. So you need to and that create can create inflationary pressures from one, from one side and deflationary pressures on, on the other side so to balance these things out i think is the the hardest part when you are dealing with these real world chucks um but for understanding the issues and the discussion first i, I think you you need to start like simple and, and like these clear-cut a x scenarios when you're presenting that you in my view, you have that additional challenge, which is to put these things in, in, in the balance um, to see what forces are the are that I, that are, um, yeah, that are, that, that there are prevailing, what, what of the shocks and forces that are prevailing. That, that will be my view, but I, I think like for, for, for teaching and to understand the concepts, I, I think it's better to start in, in the way that you say it, but always keeping in mind that when, the staff is presenting that to, to their managers and to, to the board, you have that additional problem that is that you need to decide which forces are, in, are prevailing. David, I'm not sure. I, I don't know if I lost you, like yeah, my, my connection. No, connection that, is really bad today. So, da so David, I don't know if you know Hayek, who's from, who's the head of the monetary policy department at the Cedra Bank of Armenia. So, He's the person that wants all of his staff uh, to be able to uh, do everything, all the different parts of this, to be able to understand too. Uh, but when I talk to you and I talk to him, it's like talking to the same people. So uh, I, I thought Hayek would make some comments and then you could respond to them. Or Hayek, are you, uh, are you there? Yes, Hayek, thanks. You're here? <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for, uh, Sorry for putting you on the spot. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, actually, I wanted to um, emphasize uh, two things. First of all, yeah, uh, this is uh, this is uh, I think this is this is the only and the best idea <laughs> just to have all the staff trained in the same manner, like constructing the scenario and presenting it to, to the board. What is important from the training point of view here? Of, of course, this can be done based on the one scenario, and this can uh, this can be done, by, let's say, just creating a scenario and presenting it. But what is important that I, uh, and I wanted to emphasize here with regard to case A and case B scenario, why should we also include this as a part of the training? Because very often the central bankers or the uh, forecasting team member, they think of a scenario as a projection or as a 
forecast, which is the, the most probable scenario. And usually they also are trained to do the scenario in the same manner, like getting to the best uh, or the most probable scenario. What is important also uh, for the training reason here that I wanted to emphasize that for the training reasons, we have to also clear this understanding that the scenario, this is just a list of assumptions or buckets of assumptions that we are using to create a probable or some, some kind of uh, path for the variables in the future or for the policy, uh, policy discussion into the future. And here, this is, this is the, uh, in the teaching wise, here you, we can use this model also to show that you can choose any out of this assumption, just throw it away or dig further into this assumption, make it like uh, more um, uh, understandable or more interesting or more uh, researched one and made it, make it another scenario, which can be, just can be a case B scenario and which is relevant for the policymakers. And another thing that I wanted to emphasize, these having uh, the, the training people to creating only one scenario, this is just only part of the job for the policymaking uh, team, because the policymaking team also has to, has, to, uh, has to concentrate on risk management rather than only one, one scenario. Risk management means that we have to think about some possibilities which is relevant for which are relevant for the policymakers, and we have to present that to the board in a in a in a, in a uh, articulated way for the board or, or in an intuitive way to the board in order for the board just to be able to uh, to uh, to uh, to um, to have a discussion first of all to enhance a discussion at the board level and also for the board, individual board members to try to uh, incorporate any of these risk management uh, issues uh, or, uh, or incorporate it in a weighted manner of these risk management issues into their particular individual decisions. So uh, for the training reasons, I think this is a good idea to incorporate these two, uh, two things into the training materials in order for the, for the, uh, for the people who are starting these scenarios to understand why the scenario can be different or can have case A, case B or case C scenarios even, and why it is important for the risk management rather than just getting one most probable scenario uh, scenario into uh, and, and presenting it also to the board. So for the presentation skills here, it's also very important to emphasize these two things there. This, uh, this there's my, my there's a very specific thing that I'd like you to comment on, okay? So the way that we're thinking about case A and case B, okay, kind of gets us away from on just the interest rate change today, but thinking in terms of the expected path, okay? Um, so the problem right now in the US right now is that people are going 50s, <laughs> they're gonna be 50s, okay? Or they might be 50s, there might be a 75, okay? And we're trying to think a bit more fundamentally uh, that rates might have to be a lot higher Okay, uh, uh, you know, and they, people need to think about the fundamentals when they're thinking about that question. Okay, so so our case A and case B in my mind, but I want to get I want to find out whether or not you uh, you like this or not. Is that case A is a story that rates would have to rise by more than what's in markets? Okay, so it's like you'd be telling a story to markets that we think uh, you know inflationary forces are bigger than what's priced into markets and. We're trying to nudge markets in that direction if, if the data start coming out in that direction. The idea that you only are doing monetary policy uh, maybe six or eight times a year, <laughs> and financial markets need guidance in between those times that you do it. Policy is not about just setting that darn policy rate that's completely irrelevant for most economic uh, agents in the economy that we care about in our framework because we don't care about overnight rates and stuff like that. We care about the rates and the financial conditions that are going to be facing households and firms. Okay, so case A is a path for interest rates that's higher than what's in financial markets. Case B is a path that's lower. Okay, now now that's that's how I'm thinking. We don't have to think about it that way. Uh, you can still do F past Mark II, thinking about it some other way. But but what are your? I think, for example. 
uh, for central banks that have like let, let's take the Norgus Bank and uh, and uh, and the Riggs Bank for example. Uh, they ha believe that they have to have consensus among the board to put out like one forecast, okay? Or take those central banks, and I, I don't think that's a really good idea. That misses the whole point about uh, what monetary policy is all about. Monetary policy is all about uh, encouraging this incredibly rich discussion uh, for them to uh, start every forecast off with a presentation from the staff about possibilities and then have to have an incredibly rich discussion uh, that they can then summarize uh, about what they did as a group and what they do as individuals. So uh, back to the Czech Republic, I'll give another uh, a good plug for the Czechs because they have attributed minutes. So uh, that means that the policymakers can look at this reference scenario and they can say, I, I am more pessimistic or I'm more optimistic about things. And that implies a path for the policy rate that, it, that is maybe higher than what's in uh, uh, financial markets uh, and so on. So the way that we communicate uh, central bank efficiency, uh, but David, do you like that case A, big case B, or, uh, or do you prefer a different way of, of implementing this? No, the, the, the case A, case B is, is a tidy way to get at what we're trying to get at. The, a critical point, though, is um, if we're talking about case A with a higher interest rate track than, than markets are currently thinking about, or case B with a lower interest rate track, it's not just mechanical. We just stick something in with a lower track and stick something in with a higher track. This is Jose's point, that there's a story here. There are shocks which we're thinking through, which could require interest rates to be higher. Not necessarily shocks, but it's just a, the, the way we're um, thinking about some of the nonlinear components of the uncertain components of dynamics. If it falls one way, um, those, that set of dynamics, totally plausible dynamics could require higher interest rates. Another totally plausible set of dynamics could require lower interest rates. So these are these are complete stories. They're not just let's go for something with higher interest rates. Let's go for something with lower interest rates. It's not putting confidence intervals around a track and pretending that we're doing risk analysis. This is where we're thinking through what could be going on, recognizing that we have very little certainty about any or all of the stories we're telling, what could be going on. And then in a, in a, in a similar frame to the way the New Zealanders have, have now innovated nicely to think through policy as a risk minimization exercise. We were, it's a least regrets framework that they've adopted. So thinking through these possible worlds that we could be confronting, how do we position interest rates, the path of interest rates to minimize the regrets we might have if things turned out different from uh, flipped one way or flipped the other way? Uh, could I try to make a point? Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, uh, yes, uh, this is about the, the compartmentalization and everybody uh, being able to, to do uh, everything and, and also related to the amount of uncertainty that, uh, that we have right now. Uh, I, I think the, the short term forecast, uh, those, those data points that we added as uh, observed data, uh, those are very important. Those could be uh, uh, scenarios uh, uh, equally uh, plausible, the uh, A and B scenarios, uh, even without uh, shocks. I mean, we could also have uh, case A and B as shocks, but uh, uh, I would benefit a lot from having uh, uh, 
A and B, uh, also for short-term forecasts, because uh, uh, under the huge uncertainty uh, uh, that we have, uh, uh, that we currently have, that could make a great difference for the policy policy paths. Uh, if uh, I mean, if uh, commodity prices uh, it would follow this path A and B, then the, these prices would do this and that, and, uh, and probably uh, uh, with a different short-term forecast of uh, say 100 basis points, we could have uh, a policy path that's uh, different uh, uh, by more more than 100 basis points, starting uh, by in, uh, I mean, policy paths different uh, uh, by by more than that. So uh, is is not only the the modeling, the shocks and stuff, but also that the specialized knowledge about the short-term forecast that, uh, uh, I, I don't know, at least here in, in Colombia, uh, uh, we have one, uh, one short-term forecast given by the staff, but uh, I would benefit uh, from having more short-term forecasts, more uh, uh, scenarios. Mm. <coughs> Yeah, so obviously when things are moving really fast, right? Plus, uh, in terms of incentivizing, uh, people have different views about things, uh, especially if you have more resources uh, and so on. Uh, I noticed that Nafi and Z are here. Uh, uh, Nafi and Z were uh, my, uh, two of uh, my great students uh, last year. Uh, so Nafi and Z, I was curious uh, what, uh, what you think about uh, this idea about case A and case B, um, or uh, do you like this uh, this way of thinking about things and the way of training people? Maybe they left. Um, I guess, I guess they're not here. Uh, did anybody else? Uh, Hello. Have any? Pardon? Can you hear me? Do Can it, you hear uh, me? Yes. Yeah. This is this is a team. Uh, I I work with uh, Nafi and uh, Zulfikar Heather. So Zulfikar Heather is our immediate boss. You know, Nafi and I are his teammates, and we handle left pass at the Central Bank of Pakistan. Oh, cool. So, okay. Yeah, so last training I was not uh, present and I don't know what has happened to their mic or like uh, they have trouble uh, coming in, I think so. Uh, but I am at my home because it's like uh, uh, about 9 p.m. in Pakistan. Oh, girl. And, uh, yeah, and uh, what I think, <laughs> like I don't know about their views, but yeah, what I think uh, of uh, you uh, and like your uh, FPAS Mark II, giving us an idea of, you know, how, uh, how uh, you know, fast the central bank might have to move or maybe how slow or sluggish it has to move uh, given the uncertain scenarios uh, that uh, it may, uh, you know, encounter. So I, I'm liking the idea, but, uh, but again, uh, as with uh, any, uh, you know, uh, monetary policy, forecasting exercise or uh, an exercise where you uh, are asked by the monetary policy committee that okay what we what should be done uh, given the scenario so so there is a lot of uncertainty without uh, you know looking at the framework that you are going to introduce or the without going uh, through that exercise or the training uh, it's very hard to comment on how that will be communicated right but but seems to be a fascinating idea that's that's what i believe because i i do believe that uh, the covid period if if you're going to discuss that or if you're going to discuss that that okay you are giving presentation to paul every week and you have that uh, like access to data during that week so still uh, I, I would like to know that how that fast incoming information will be incorporated to, into something and uh, some results will be drawn so it seems like an interesting idea. That's what my two uh, cents. Okay, so so uh, in two weeks, okay, we'll be taking you through uh, our first cut, 
at the menu driven front end and the uh, global forecasting school will be up, okay? Uh, we're going to be letting uh, people like Nafi and Z that were with us last year, uh, we're gonna let them in for a month, okay? Because we wanna kind of retool all these guys uh, that, that, uh, that effectively supported us uh, last year. Okay, so we appreciate uh, the support of all the institutions that have uh, that have been, you know, attending our courses and and so on. Uh, next week, uh, we're going to have James Hamilton here, uh, and James is going to talk. Uh, James is always he's, he's done work that that covers uh, you know virtually everything. But next week, he's going to talk about uh, oil, the oil market sanctions. Uh, as all the uh, probabilities of recessions and stuff like that. So uh, if, you, if you love uh, James's work, uh, uh, join us next week. And two weeks from now, uh, you'll be able to see this. Uh, it will be the first cut. So don't expect uh, the most wonderful user experience as these, uh, as these computer scientists say that nowadays, right? Uh, but it will be the first crack at, at creating uh, a front end for this, and then the sophistication of it, uh, the country coverage of it will grow over uh, time. Okay, but uh, but anyway, unless uh, David, do you have any closing remarks? And thank you, yeah, David. I, just wanna, I, I wanted to jump in on Hike's point about uh, training the entire staff, uh, and um, basically <laughs> applaud the point. Um, which is you won't find surprising as you, as you consider us doppelgangers, but uh, the I think the there is a difficulty uh, in the way economists are trained because they do uh, are encouraged to search for a truth, and they're encouraged to knock down other uh, ideas which are um, uh, you, you take you take a uh, a position that's been established in the literature and then you do some work to show how that's wrong and a better way of thinking about it is this. And here you say, you know, this is the, this is the right way to think about this problem. That's the kind of way we train economists. And we train them to uh, compete with each other for uh, being able to articulate the most likely or the best way of thinking about these things or whatever. It's, it's, it's going to be a challenge to get people to become uh, more reasonably humble about their lack of knowledge and about our collective lack of knowledge. And to be able to move into a world where we can actually talk about things without uh, trying to, dis to claim any particular understanding of the truth. So getting everybody to move their, getting their mindsets for everybody to move in that direction, I think is a much richer way of thinking about it than, for example, creating A and B scenarios by setting up two competing teams, one of which is tasked with creating an A scenario, one tasked with creating a B scenario, and then that turns into a, some kind of a fight over what is the right way of thinking about it. That's an unhealthy direction by comparison with the direction that Hayek's thinking of taking things. So I applaud the way he's thinking of going. Me, uh, me too. Um, so thanks, Felix for, uh, and Miriam for uh, all the work on this consumption function and David, of course, uh, for uh, encouraging us to, to do all this work. Uh, and it was really nice to see uh, uh, some of you again uh, after uh, we've taken a bit of a break here. So we'll see you next time. <laughs>